Today, I'll be reading from John 18, 33 through 37, and it's the New American Standard. Therefore, Pilate entered again into the Praetorium, and he summoned Jesus, and he said, Are you the king of Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this of your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Amen. Thank you, Virginia. Today is Christ the King Sunday, and I'd like to talk about belonging to the truth of our King Jesus Christ. Today, we look at that truth about our king. Not only who is the commander-in-chief, ultimately, not only whom is our supreme leader, ultimately, not only who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, but what do you say about that one who is Lord of Lord, King of Kings, Supreme Commander, and Commander-in-Chief, the one who guides us all, <clears throat> the one under whom Everyone sits and waits for direction. And then the other question would be, <clears throat> who gets to tell us the truth about that? <clears throat> Have y'all noticed any differences in versions of Jesus, you see? I would say it's quickly, the answer is yes. <clears throat> there are people who not only are deciding whether to follow Christ, but they're also deciding what is the nature of this Christ that we follow. What would Jesus say to do and what would Jesus say not to do? What would Jesus tell us to value and what would Jesus say can't be of as much value? It's crucial. And in this passage that Virginia read, <clears throat> which is one small part of the trial that leads to the cru crucifixion of Jesus in the Gospel of John, I think some things are made clear that often aren't, for me anyway, always clear. And yet when I came back to this passage and began to read it and reflect on it and began to read commentaries on what was thought about it, I thought, you know, sometimes I don't give this as deep a thought as is right there in front of us in this passage. One thing to understand is that truth in the New Testament was not an individual question. I'm letting it sink in because we're Americans and we don't, we don't like knowing that. <clears throat> Truth in the New Testament was not an individual question. The truth in the New Testament was, who are you with? Who's, who's your group? <clears throat> and if you go back to the Old Testament, they were dead serious about it. I mean, people died because they were so dead serious. If you didn't keep the law, you were taken outside of the, of the, of the, of the, of the camp, and bad things were done to you. In fact, the first martyr of the Christian tradition is Stephen, and he was stoned to death, and he was stoned to death in harmony with an understanding of God and the law. You don't go along with us, we take you outside, we stone you. And Jesus comes along, and he gives us a version of the truth and says, I want you to be my ecclesia, my church. I want you to come together as my people. And when you come together as my people, it's going to be different. But in the New Testament, there wasn't a bidding to come and individually just all on your own without any other references beside what you think is right and wrong. In fact, that is by the very definition, grabbing the fruit off the tree, taking a bite and getting kicked out of the garden. When you understand the will of God, you are in harmony with God and with everyone else in terms of love. It doesn't mean everyone acts the same or doesn't. In fact, some people will slap you on the cheek, smack you right in the head. And Jesus is like, oh, yeah, that's the point at which you just stop it. You don't go along with them anymore. You don't get along with them anymore. You smack them back. That's what you do. That's not what Jesus said. 
You understand? This is really a problem for me. I'm an American. I'm a fuller. I, I don't have time to go into that, but there's a lot of individualism and you got to be strong and make a lot of money and all that stuff and fuller being a fuller. So let's look at the truth because the truth sets us free. And the truth that sets us free includes some things that I believe are pointed to in this passage and in the broader passage of the trial and crucifixion of Christ that's in the Gospel of John. The first is it tells the truth about who we really are. Notice it's the truth about who we really are. Are we Christians? Are we little Christ? And are we a community of little Christ? Are we a community of disciples? Are we a community of people who get up every morning? live our whole day, go to bed at night, seeking and following Jesus Christ. I just want you to understand that the early, early church, the New Testament, really does say that's who we are. We are those people. You see, some were Jews and became Christians, little Christ. Some were Gentiles, not of Hebrew descent, and became followers and were Christian, little Christ. Absolutely shocking. We talked about it before. I'll keep talking about it again. When you got to Pentecost and it opened up, and then you read the rest of the book of Acts, they kept including all those other people. Stop including all those other people. Those people who don't act like us and don't talk like us. Those people who have different values. You, you keep bringing these people in who have so much to learn. Just stop bringing people in who have a lot to learn. It's like you want people to be born again in this place. Oh, yeah, that's exactly what it is. We test our belonging, and our belonging shapes our identity. Who do you and I belong to? Who is our basic identity shaped by? I've got a bunch of them, don't y'all? I'm a fuller, ain't no doubt about it. I figured out after learning about my family that there's also some Freeman stuff going on inside of me and some Deaton stuff and some Hicks stuff. And if you went on back, the family tree would get really complicated. And we'd lead all the way back to God saying, let's make people in our own image. And here we go. Well, test our belongings, where we belong, then relationships. What's my identity in my household? What's my identity in my church, my religion? What's my identity in my city, in my county, in my state, in my nation, in the world? What's my identity? I just want to give us all a break. You and I have a bunch of different identities. And our problem is, and right now it's magnified in our world, because we're really confused about our identity. We are really confused, really confused about our identity. How do we cooperate? I don't know if you've ever studied the uh, making of the American Constitution. There's a book called Making of the American Constitution. And it turns out that some of our, uh, some of our founding fathers uh, had arguments. Did y'all know that? They really had arguments. I mean, downright nasty arguments. And one of the things, like John Jay was like, I tell you who Americans are. Americans are people who are Christian and from Western Europe, who come from the, the certain countries, and who are male and uh, and own property. And George Washington comes along and says, no, I'm going to tell you who Americans are. It's anyone who seeks freedom and comes here and becomes a citizen and, sub and becomes loyal to the Constitution. Anyone. You understand that's not the same thing? It's still not the same thing. We fought a civil war over that question. And a lot of people died. And we, in our national identity, have a disagreement. It's an original disagreement. You hear what I'm saying? Original. It's always been there. who gets to be in. And so I just want to give us all a break. 
when we decide to be Jesus followers, when we decide to be Christian, the question comes, is Jesus Lord of all? This is Christ the King, son. Is he Lord of everything? And he's standing there, and Pilate's asking him, are you trying to be Lord the way Caesar is Lord? Because if you are that kind of king, I promise you, if, they, if Jesus had said yes and Pilate understood, yes, I'm that kind of king, he would have killed Jesus right then, didn't need the Jews' help. That's his job, is to kill everybody who tries to be king like Caesar. Do we pay the tribute tax, Jesus was asked? Show me whose image is on that coin. Who is that? Who is it? Caesar. Then give Caesar what's Caesar. Give God what's God. It's really a question. Pilate was right there asking Jesus that you did something. I'm not a Jew. They brought you. They say you're, you're breaking the law. And the, and the Jewish people were recognizing, oh, this is a different thing. When you start telling us the temple is no longer necessary, when you start telling us that all these other people are included, that is not what we have in mind, and we have to get rid of you. You keep wanting to include and love everybody, and we want to get rid of you because you keep saying that. You're going to include people like that, George Fuller. You know how those Fullers are. Truth about who we really are, I would just like to say we are in Christ. Nothing that came into existence came into existence without Christ. Nothing that is sustained is sustained without Christ. Christ is the one in whom we live and move and have our being. And our identity, our primary loyalty is as Christian. Amen. The other truth is about the, how the kingdom of God is built. And that's a big one. Because I think we just took communion. I'm just saying, everybody that here that took the bread and the cup, we all have said, yes, Christian. I, I'm right on, right on target. I took the bread and the cup without hypocrisy. I follow Jesus Christ. But then you have to start working out how does Jesus actually build his kingdom? John 3.16 is one we love, right? We, a lot of people love John 3.16. And I would just like to offer you John 3.16 and 17 and the context of the gospel of John. We could go to the rest of the New Testament, but I like to be done by noon like you do. And so we're going to just stick with John. Jesus said, right there in that moment with Nicodemus, God so loved the, the, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe, and remember, pisces, the Greek word, means to be actively committed to, not to think something's true. So just so far. I so, God so loved this whole mess, this whole reality that he gave this one unique reality so that those who were actively committed to this one reality would not perish. In other words, the way we do it without that, we perish. Have y'all noticed wars and rumors of war? And Jesus said, as long as you don't get this straight, you're going to have wars and rumors of war. And he said, here's how it's going to be. You're, you're, you're going to find that following me is like a sword. It's going to put Parents against children, brothers and sisters against each other, neighbors against each other, because it's going to be clear to you and to everyone that you're following a different Lord than they are. Truth about how the kingdom of God is built. Keep reading. Keep going. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Eternal life is not go to heaven when you, when you die. Absolutely, eternity includes after you die. But eternal life is the, is the living, beautiful, exuberant nature of being in life relationship with God, with loving and living and, and God having what God wants in your life. That's when you're eternally alive. Why do you follow Jesus Christ? Why are you committed to Jesus Christ? So that you can have eternal life, full God life, God's life in you, God's life through you. The Son verse 17 continues, did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And salvation is not just going to heaven when you die. Salvation is the healing of everything. Wouldn't you love to go into a doctor's office? And I'm glad I have a general practitioner. 
Have y'all ever been in a specialist office and thought all that doctor cares about is the thing he's special here or she is specializing? Have you ever seen that? You go into a general, but what if you went into a general practitioner's office and the general practitioner looked in your eyes and said, okay, looks all right to me. I'm not, I don't have a pain in my eyes. I have, I have this real big knot that's been growing in my side for a long time. Uh, your eyes look fine. Salvation is not go to heaven when you die. Your eyes look fine. Salvation is let me look at the entirety of your life, everything about your life, and let's work at putting it right. God so loved the world that the world through Christ might be saved, and we are part of that. How does the kingdom of God come about? I don't know exactly how that happens. Here's one thing I do know, that when Jesus is Lord, everything I have a voice in, a vote in, influence in, I am obligated as a Christian to bring it into harmony with the kingdom of God as revealed in Jesus Christ. That makes me very annoying and you very annoying to people who don't want that. I promise. In fact, he said, if you don't hate your father, Jesus said, if you don't hate your father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even your own life, you're not going to enter the kingdom of God. In other words, if all those other loyalties are the ones you really love, and he doesn't mean by hate, dishonor, he took care of his mama when he was dying on the cross in the gospel of God. Took care of his mom. He's not talking about disrespect. He's talking about hating it. Like, I will not be Lord. I will not be the follower of a Lord called mama. I will not be a follower of the Lord called daddy. I will not be a follower of the Lord called anything or anyone other than Christ. That's how it's built. And I don't know how that works out. Like we have to be good news to the poor. But if you don't think that that has to happen through government, then you're part of a solution for the poor that's not the government. Period. Because if you have no compassion for and are not part of responding to the poor, then you're in disobedience to the lordship of Jesus Christ. If people are lost and lonely and distressed, and you don't and you don't find a way to get to the lost and the lonely and the distressed, then you have decided that there's a Lord higher than Christ. That's what I do. All of y'all do it. I do it. I sit around deciding all the time what I pay attention to, what I don't. And when Jesus shows me the next thing to do, I'm often, eh, I don't really want to listen fully to that because that has implications. Next is the truth about belonging to Jesus Christ and not the world. And that's what Pilate was real clear on. He's like, your, your, your people brought you here. What'd you do? And when he understood Jesus, he turned him back over to the Jews because he understood his kingdom was not the kind of kingdom that threatened Caesar directly. There was not going to be an army. In fact, earlier in the story, when they come to arrest Jesus, Peter takes out the sword. You can, you can understand this guy who's going to end up denying him in just a little bit. He takes out the sword because now it's coming. We're going to take out our sword. We're going to call everybody together. We're going to, we're going to kick some you-know-what, and we're out of here. And he cuts the ear off the, off the guy, and Jesus says, stop, put the sword back up. That's not the way I do it. And Jesus is very clear, and Pilate understood it. So he said, I turned him back over to the Jews. And if the Jews had thought he wasn't a, a threat, you know, he, all he's talking about is everybody having a good prayer life and staying Jewish and keeping the temple up and observing the law the way we tell them to observe the law, keep on doing everything we told them to do. But that's not what he was about. He says to Pilate, for this, this this way of getting to the truth, the way I'm showing right now. This is why I came into the world. King, a government political leader. No, nah, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about being the ruler of everything. And the problem is we think we can often think that doesn't apply to politics. It actually do. It does apply. It applies to everything we have a voice in, a vote in, and, and have influence in. Who tells us the truth about what it means to be a follower of Christ and not a follower of the world's various power structures? Who directs our lives? You know something we've, we've come to understand and accept in the United States of America 
is the idea of a conscientious objector, right? Originally, in World War I, when people would claim conscientious objection and would say, I will not kill another person, Mennonites, Hutterites, uh, Moravians, Quakers, I'm not going to kill anybody. Uh, they were actually persecuted. Then we developed a way in which they could take on non-combatant roles. Uh, I was so much a part of the military culture, I sought to be a chaplain for a while, and a football injury kept me out. And, and what was that? I really thought that the conscience and the spirit of people in the military was in conflict all the time, all the time in conflict. When do you do violence in the name of your country? You're told when to do that. When do you do violence in the name of Jesus as a Christian? That's a different question. Sometimes the answer is the same, and sometimes the answer is not. The truth about belonging to Jesus Christ and not the world is that when the world, in whatever form it takes, mom, dad, any other form of authority tells you what to do, and it's in conflict with what you understand the will of God is, you choose Jesus. The early church knew it, and the early church was persecuted, and their property was taken because they would not follow the authorities. So every allegiance is under God. Every allegiance is under God as revealed in Jesus Christ. That means we have to come to understand our belonging in Jesus Christ, how we belong in Jesus Christ, our identity in Jesus Christ, and come to understand our role together, individually and together, but together, so that we can be following Jesus Christ. I thought I'd end with a story that I hope helps understand, helps us understand what I believe is the possibility of Christ's church if we become Christian more thoroughly. Uh, recently, I was walking out of a grocery store. I put my bags in the trunk, shut the trunk, sat down in the car, and I thought, man, I'm hungry. I might have to get me something to eat. Exactly. It's hilarious. I've just been in a place that had everything you could ever want to eat and everything you wanted to fix to fix something to eat. And I'm sitting there in the car, and I'm hungry. It's hilarious. I just want you to understand something. That when people have a hungry soul, and this is the grocery store, they'll be here. And if we take the bread and the cup, and we sit in our car, and we don't have everything we need, Maybe we're asking someone else other than the source of everything to give us what we need. You see, I don't know about you, but I like that McDonald's drive through You know, take the time to buy that healthy stuff. Take it home and take the time to make a meal out of it. Invite people you love over to hang out and remind you how awesome you are. You tell them how awesome they are. Everybody just get together. What happens Thursday? Yeah. And one of the things I'd just like us to reflect on this week is are we grateful for everything and is Jesus Lord of everything? Where do we go that meets every need we have? Jesus. And how do those needs get met? It's when we build the kingdom of God in harmony with the words and the will and the, uh, and the revelation of Jesus. So I would just like to give you a summary statement that comes from Jesus himself. If you ask me what's the greatest commandment, I just want to quote Jesus. Love God with 
Remember King of Kings, Lord of Lords, with all your heart, soul, body, mind, and strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. How do we do that? I don't know. And I just want you to know, in all of those sub-lordships, nation and community and workplace and consumer patterns, you know, what you buy and don't buy and where you work and all of that stuff. I just want you to know, if you guys disagree with me and I disagree with you, I love you because I don't love you based on my nationalistic understandings or my how the consumer products should be uh, consumed or how we're related to a thousand other things. I have chosen to love you in Jesus Christ. Right? They're getting ready to feed us. So I would like us to have a moment of prayer. And in that prayer, I would like us to recognize that we have a bunch of identities going on in our hearts and minds and souls. And that what we want to pray for right now is that we'll come together under the one identity that we've been given on this day with the bread and the cup, the identity of being a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ, a Christian. Lord, I do thank you for your love. We can't figure it out. Every time I think I've got it figured out, I look foolish later. Exactly how it works out. Exactly how it ought to work in my household, in my workplaces, in my community, in my nation, in my world. But right here, right now, I ask that you would help and begin with me help us by your spirit to submit to you as the one lord of our lives for you've given us everything and you love us completely and your spirit is here with us so now we receive you again fresh and anew and we follow you and we will love one another as we love ourselves that's what we want you to help us do we want to love one another the way you love us help us to do that in the name of christ Amen.